Okay, good morning. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. You know we're getting down to it because I've got my notes. So, uh, good morning. I'm Dave Wilson with the Otto Jordan Museum, and on behalf of all of us here, uh, we want to welcome and thank you so much for spending time with us this morning for this incredibly special event we have here today. Uh, first, uh, we want to recognize that the Idol Jord sits upon the lands of the Miami, Potawatomi, Lenape, Shawnee, Kickapoo, and Peoria peoples. We'd also like to acknowledge all Native and Indigenous peoples forced through these lands by the relocation policies and acts of the United States government. The lands of the Idol Jord Museum and Indianapolis and Indiana are and always will be Native lands first, and as an institution, we strive to amplify and showcase the art, culture, and voices of those communities. So, thank you. Um, as you can see by today's turnout, uh, the program that we have here today has been one of the most anticipated events on our calendar related to the changing views, the photography of Dorothea Lang exhibition that opened just last month. Uh, we are so honored to have Jean Umamura and her daughter Catherine Foley uh, to share such an incredible important story today. Um, and we'll get to why that's related in just a moment. Events like these would not be possible without the generous support of our partners and we are extremely grateful uh, for Barnes & Thornburg, which is a national full service law firm headquartered here in Indianapolis that has uh, a full service uh, dedicated Japanese service group and to the Japan Foundation, New York, for their support. Most importantly, I want to give a special thanks to Teresa Kolzak, Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Indiana, and her incredible team of Jeremiah Maxwell and Minori Abel for all of their help, guidance, support, introduction to great folks for today's event, and for the beautiful flower arrangement. That's all on them. So how about uh, a round of applause for all of our great We are recording today because this is such a historical moment and we want to be able to keep this amazing record of history uh, and continue it. So we please ask that you take a moment to silence your cell phones or at least make sure they're on vibrate as we get ready to get started. And as I mentioned, Jean, uh, the story between her, her story and the Dorothy Lane connection might not necessarily be obvious at first. Lang, of course, is known uh, perhaps best known for her photography chronicling, chronicling the many faces of the Great Depression. But throughout her four decade long career, Lang was a passionate advocate for using photography to inform and educate the public on the harsh realities everyday people faced due to a wide range of issues from economic depression, the environment, and or government policies. Her images captured unprecedented hardships yet often reflected the dignity and resilience of her subjects. In no place is that more apparent than in her work documenting the process of forced relocation and the incarceration of Japanese Americans and those of Japanese descent during World War II. The Changing Views exhibit highlights her work documenting, documenting the experience of those who were forcibly incarcerated at Manzanar, California, and thanks to her photography and others, we get to see, from their perspective, what life was like for some of those 125,000 people who lived through that, what is considered to be, by many, one of the biggest civil rights violations in American history. Today, we are honored not only to have the opportunity to see, but to hear what it was like directly from someone who lived those experiences. So today, we are so honored to have our guest here today, and I've mentioned Jean already, but she deserves a much better introduction than I can provide. And so, it's my honor to ask her daughter, Kathy Foley, to do that for me. And although Jean's presentation will be in English today, we will have a question and answer session uh, afterwards, and uh, we have an interpreter 
So for those that may be more comfortable asking a question in Japanese, we will be able to have uh, Yoko. She was from your brethren. She'll be here, ah, here up here to help translate or help assist. So we hope everyone will feel comfortable talking about this important topic and be excited to hear from our guests. So Kathy, it is now your turn. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot about this. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning to our friends at the Barrington who walked in, our friends from JCL, our friends from uh, Jazzy, our friends from all over. Um, so many of you mean a lot to us. Now, my mom and I have tissues. One is, for those of you who are Hoosiers, you know the pollen has been terrible. <laughs> so, I am moved by my mom's story, <laughs> but I also need to be blocked by no substitutes. So we've got plenty of tissue up here. <laughs> okay, well, I am uh, Jean Umara's oldest daughter and oldest child. I was born in New Jersey, but have lived most of my life except the first four years here in Indianapolis. So I am an authentic Japanese American Hoosier. And thank you, Dave, for those wonderful comments in the background of this amazing museum. My husband and I both really appreciate this setting, so we're, we're honored to be here. And thanks for giving my mom the opportunity to share a very personal and important time in the history of our country. You know, it's really interesting as I reflect on learning about the internment camps myself. It wasn't until I was in high school that I think there was a little sidebar in one of the history books that mentioned Japanese internment camps. So I think over dinner, I asked a question, and my parents go, hmm, that was just Cam, and they moved on. And it's only been in the last 10 or 15 years that I've had the honor to hear more details and to hear how hard it was but the effect that this experience has had on our whole family, particularly my mother and father, George and Jean, and then really it's been the legacy in our family, so I'm honored to hear it one more time with a few more details. Now my father, who you see up here, George Umamura, uh, worked at Lilly for most of his career. He, has a couple, he had a couple of degrees from Indiana University, and I know some of you are affiliated with IU, Anyway, he passed away two years ago, so he's here with us in our hearts, but uh, not here in person. But before I hand over the mic to my mom, I'd like to introduce my younger brothers. See, I'm the older sister, so I asked Dave to let me have the mic. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I've got two younger brothers, they're both here, Wes Umamura from Denver, Colorado and Carrie Umamura and his wife Nancy and their son Joel who traveled here from Salt Lake City to be here today to support our moms. Welcome family. And I don't want to miss and want to acknowledge my husband Bob Foley who's running the slides, a very important part of the presentation. <laughs> Now you heard, you know, my mom's 96, and she is a little bit concerned that she can't see the slides while she's talking to you. So just keep your thumbs up, tell her it's okay, mom's doing a good job. Okay, just wanted to make sure you know what your role is. Okay. Well, now I have the privilege of introducing um, you to my mom, Jean K. Kano Umamura, and she's today's presenter. As you have heard, she's not your average 96-year-old woman. She taught in Washington Township here in Indianapolis for 30 years as an elementary school teacher. And many times when we are in public places, or even again this morning, we are stopped because a former student wants to say thank you for the influence that she had in their lives. She played tennis until she was 88 years old at the Indianapolis Racquet Club. And believe me, she wanted to win. 
She also danced for many years with the Circle City Dancers at the Indiana State Fair. So we are proud of all of her accomplishments and many interests, including the fact that she has three children, uh, seven grandchildren, and, and ten great-grandchildren. The most recent one was born this week. So, <laughs> great family lineage. But today, we know you're here to hear her story about her life in the Minidoka camp from 1942 to 1944. So I'd like to turn the mic over now to my mom, Jean Ola. Thank you very much. I want to tell you a little bit about myself before I get into the evacuation process. <clears throat> if some of you cannot hear or understand what I'm saying, please raise your hand and I'll try to make myself uh, speak a little louder if necessary. <clears throat> but my story begins in Seattle, Washington, where I was born and lived for 15 years of my youth. Can all of you hear? <laughs> My family consisted of a father, mother, older sister Mary, and a twin brother John. Both of my parents immigrated from Japan around the early 1900s. We lived in an area called Green Lake, which is located in the northern part of Seattle. My father owned and operated a dry cleaning business near this lake. My mother worked alongside of him, pressing and sewing the delicate dresses and clothes which were brought in by the customers. My father used a large pressing machine <clears throat> to press the men's suits and coats and hats. He also delivered these items to the customers they worked very hard, and their work was appreciated by their customers. Our life was a happy one. Our neighbors were of German and Scandinavian descent. They were friendly and kind. My sister and I studied music, she the violin and I the piano. I also loved uh, dancing lessons and riding my bike. My brother loved sports, especially baseball. One Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, we heard terrible news on the radio. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. That's in Hawaii. The news came as a shock to all Americans, including us. I remember how devastated my parents felt knowing that their countrymen attacked the country we lived in and loved. My parents also became afraid. Would our American friends and neighbors question their loyalty? Would my parents be considered enemy aliens? They were less, <clears throat> they were Issei's, which is first generation, and the laws of our country barred them from citizenship. <coughs> we children were Nisei's second generation and were American citizens. I remember going to school the next day and the principal gathered the students in the auditorium. President Roosevelt was speaking on the radio to our nation. He declared war on Japan. As I sat amongst my classmates, I felt like everyone's eyes were on me, especially when he said the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and their bombs with their bombs and planes. I always felt proud to be an American and had a great sense of pride whenever I said the Pledge of Allegiance. But somehow I felt the, like the enemy, probably because I looked like the enemy being Japanese, and a very sad and sh shameful feeling went through my body. The weeks that followed December 7th, 1941, became a nightmare for many of the people of Japanese ancestry. 
fathers who were community leaders, <coughs> editors of Japanese newspapers or magazines, businessmen, Japanese language teachers, and even religious leaders were rounded up by the FBI and put in jail without any reason given. For the families involved in this time was a period of fear and worry. Our father was not taken away, but we were still filled with uncertainty and anxiety of the unknown. <clears throat> Excuse me. A curfew was enforced, and we could not leave our home from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. A five-mile travel limit kept us restricted to areas close to home. My parents could no longer attend their church, nor could my father make deliveries beyond the five-mile limit. Families were required to turn in their shortwave radios, cameras, binoculars, and firearms to the local police. My father turned in his Kodak camera. We children continued to attend school, but I remember I was not as enthused about attending school as I used to be. Business for my parents definitely took a downturn. Neighbors who used to stop by and say hello or chat no longer continued that practice. My piano teacher asked that I not play in the recital that was coming up. I was devastated because I was not only, I had not only practiced very hard, but I also liked my teacher very much and could not help but feel that because I was Japanese, she no longer liked me. Newspapers and magazines, radio newscasters and politicians all fanned the fear and hateful feelings toward the Japanese. Headlines like, send the Japs away, don't let them come back, appeared in the newspapers. And signs displayed on windows of businesses and storefronts. <clears throat> our father and mother discussed our future. Should we go to Japan and live with my father's family? who raised silkworms, or stay here in the U.S. and face a very uncertain future. The three of us decided that we should stay here in the U.S. even though we did not know what would happen to our parents. Our parents decided that we should not go to Japan and we would stay here in the United States and face the unknown. For several weeks, there were all kinds of rumors of what the government was going to do with the people of Japanese ancestry. The order was used for the purpose of removing. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. The order was used for the purpose of removing and incarcerating all people of Japanese ancestry, even American citizens. It authorized General DeWitt, a military commander, to exclude all persons of Japanese descent even as much as one each sixteenth Japanese from parts of Arizona, California, and Oregon, and Washington. DeWitt's detention orders were for the purpose of protecting the West Coast <coughs> excuse me, against sabotage and espionage. But babies, orphans, adopted children, the infirmed and bedridden, elderly, were also imprisoned. Children of the, multi <clears throat> of the multiple ancestors were included 
if they had any Japanese ancestry at all. Non-Japanese spouses, adoptive parents, orphanage directors were forced to surrender their children for incarceration or enter the camps themselves. The only exceptions were those confirmed in prisons and asylums. When Executive Order 9066 went into effect, there were no families for keeping, excuse me, there were no facilities in keeping the evacuees. The first centers at Manzanar, California, and Poston, Arizona, were Army reception centers. These centers were hastily transferred to the War Relocation Authority. There were 15 temporary detention camps scattered throughout Arizona, California, and Washington. They were mostly county fairgrounds, racetracks, livestock exhibition that were hastily then converted into detention camps and barbed wire fences, searchlights, and guard towers. <clears throat> These camps began receiving Japanese Americans late in March of 1942 and in most cases were not completed for living purposes. When they were completed, they were inadequate in size, sanitation, and protection from the elements. The Japanese Americans suffered incalculable economic losses as a result of relocation. We were forced to settle our affairs, like sell our businesses, homes, cars, furniture, etc., in a matter of days or weeks between notification and actual evacuation. Many individuals fell victim to financial opportunists who bought property and possessions far below the market value. My father sold his business, car, furniture, and many of our belongings because there was no place to store these items at the time we were moved. We had to leave, I had to leave, my favorite books and piano and bike and my doll collection. We went to camp with items we could carry plus bedding items. The hardest part of leaving was saying goodbye to friends and pets. Many tears were shed. And we also shed more tears when our sister Mary was separated from our family. Arrangements were made so that my older sister Mary would live in an eastern Washington, Pullman, Washington to be specific. A minister friend of ours whom we knew in Seattle was moved to Pullman to head a church there. He reached out to us before we were evacuated and said that Mary could continue her violin studies at the college and live with them. This separation from the family caused more tears. My sister did not want to be separated from us. However, her move there led to other opportunities that helped our parents several years later down the road, and I'll tell you about that a little later. While the permanent camp was being constructed, we were sent to a temporary camp in Puyallup, Washington. It was called Camp Harmony. This is where the state fair was usually held. It was divided into four areas with barbed wire fences around each area. Guard towers, searchlights surrounded each of the areas. Each family was assigned a room. Because the walls between each room did not go all the way up to the ceiling, we could hear the voices of our neighbors on either side of us. The crying, quarreling, snoring, <laughs> talking and yelling, all kinds of sounds could be heard. One of the first things we had to do upon arrival to this camp was to fill ticking sack with straw. That was our mattress while living in Puyallup. We also had to stand in line 
for everything. To eat in the dining room, to take a shower, and go to the latrine. We lived in a temporary camp for at least five to six months. In September of 1942, we were moved to Hunt, Idaho, and entered Minidoka relocation camp. Close to 10,000 people lived in Minidoka. It was in the middle of a desert. It was so desolate that trees did not grow there, only sagebrush. Yes, several watchtowers with military men and their rifles greeted us. How did we get there? By train. However, we were not allowed to open the shutters. Consequently, we rode for many hours without ever knowing where we were or what the countryside looked like. Living quarters were crowded. No privacy and one room to a family. The size of the room is about 20 feet by 24 feet. Now you might remember those two numbers because when you go home tonight, measure out 20 feet by 24 and see how large that might be or how comfortable you might feel if that were your room. <clears throat> there was one light bulb in the middle of the room, a pop belly stove that burned coal, and no furniture. That was our new home. No running water or cooking facilities. We had to go to the mess hall for all our meals. As the weeks passed, my father and mother made attempts to make the room cheerful. My mother ordered fabric from the Sears and Roebuck catalog and made curtains for the bare windows. Father hung sheets between the beds so each could have some privacy. We also managed to come home with, he also managed to come home with a few pieces of lumber and borrowed some tools to make a table and some bench type chairs. My father also enjoyed getting out his easel and brushes and watercolors and sketchbooks and soon filled them with the many sights that he saw surrounding him in camp. The camp was laid out so that there were about 40 to 44 blocks. Each block consisted of 12 barracks with one mess hall where people had their meals a recreational hall, and a building with latrines and showers and a laundry area. <clears throat> Each barrack consisted of six rooms, which was labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F. Each of the 12 barracks were numbered 1 to 12. I lived in barrack block 21, barrack nine and room C. When my friends wrote to me from Seattle, they would write my address, 219C Hunt, Idaho. That was my new address. The winters were bitter and cold and the sand turned to mud when it rained or snowed. In the summer, the temperatures were extremely hot and the tar paper that covered the outside of our barracks absorbed the sun's rays and kept the heat inside. We functioned like a small town or city and some people used their talents and skills and abilities to set up the many necessary services one needed in order to uh, function like a cook, waitress, garbage collector, <clears throat> excuse me, truck driver, farmer, teacher, doctor, and or even a fireman. My mother and I 
volunteered to help in the mess hall shortly after we arrived. And I remember straining food for the babies in our block. Well, after several months, the government decided that it was important to educate the children in camp. So schools were opened on October 1st, 1942. Now we were evacuated earlier that year, if you would recall, from our homes. So that was several months of not going to school. The new, the school was made up of the same type of material that our home was. The rooms were larger, with desks and tables and chairs and benches that filled the room. Teachers were hired from outside the camp, as well as those who qualified inside the camp. There was an elementary school, junior high school, and senior high school. There was a superintendent of schools, principal for each of the schools, and guidance counselors were hired. I attended school in camp for two and a half years. It wasn't anything like the high school I left, which was called Roosevelt High School in Seattle. But I had to make the best of the situation. We had after school clubs, and I joined the home ec club and French club. They had intramural sports like baseball and basketball and volleyball. <clears throat> there were even dances like the junior prom and the senior prom. I remember trying to keep up my piano practice and making an attempt to practice in the, in the uh, rec hall. We had a recreational hall. Each of the blocks had a recreational hall whenever possible. <clears throat> easy. Fathers no longer were the breadwinners, and many parents lost control of their children. Families rarely <clears throat> ate meals together. I remember my parents trying to encourage us to all, as a family, line up, go through the line, sit down on these tables and benches, and eat together. But you know, when you're a teenager, for some reason, you're much, it's more fun to eat with your friends. <laughs> so consequently, we didn't eat with our parents very often. And that was a little upsetting to my mother and father. The other thing that we used to like to do was to go to the different blocks to see who had the best dessert. <laughs> And if we heard that a certain cook on a certain block, and see, we were in block 21, so I could have gone, we could have gone south and have gotten uh, to the lower blocks, or we could have gotten, gone north and gotten to uh, some higher block than 21. And if we heard that a special block, like let's say 35, had the best strawberry, whatever dessert you might have. That's where we lined up. So you can tell that there was a lot of confusion uh, as to where you're supposed to eat and where you shouldn't eat. And we knew, we were old enough to know that we shouldn't do that, but it was more fun to, to kind of change our eating habits. So. The other thing that our father, that I know about the parents being rather concerned about, and not just our parents, but other people's parents, were dance, the dances that we had, would hold in the barracks uh, on maybe Saturday night. And we'd turn all the lights off and play all the Frank Sinatra songs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, dance away the night, and my father the next morning would say, well, why was it so dark in the, in the, in the room? 
a room where the dancers were held. They were held in the dining hall that we used to eat in earlier that evening. <clears throat> but all the tables and, and the benches were moved to the side. And uh, I used to say, well, it's more fun to dance in the dark. <laughs> I thought I didn't like that. <laughs> Um, so we had all kinds of problems. My parents were frightened, um, you know, because the future, they thought about the future, and it was so unpredictable and hopeless. Uh, there was a lot of concern as to how long we would be in camp and the fact that they weren't earning an income, and many things uh, were of concern to them. They didn't need, many people, in fact, did not even expect to come out of camp alive. <clears throat> Overwhelming despair caused some people to commit suicide, and many died prematurely because of inadequate medical fa facilities and the harsh environment. It was somewhat difficult to stay healthy. <clears throat> My father then had the desire to leave camp and get back to normal living. And the government said that if you applied and you, wherever you want to live, whether it's Chicago or way east in Connecticut, where there were a lot of job openings, um, if you had a way to make a living, you were uh, given a place to live safely, then you were allowed to leave and they gave you something like $25 for each person in the family, and um, that was supposed to take care of transportation, I guess. However, my sister, who was living in um, um, uh, Wisconsin, oh, excuse me, I forgot for a minute where she was, she was, because she was separated from us, she was playing the violin at a church conference and met a minister from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this minister, you know, was trying to get acquainted with my sister and he said, asked her a lot of questions about her parents and her sister and brother, where were they and why are they not, you know, living together? And when she told him about the, the fact that we were living in a camp, uh, she then, he, he then, excuse me, uh, said that he would do something to help my parents. And he found a place in Ann Arbor for us to live, jobs for my parents at a dry cleaning business. And uh, he was also able to help my sister and the University of Michigan Music School. Uh, so uh, with his help, we were able to leave camp. And so we moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. My brother John <clears throat> then enrolled in a, in a college in Kansas <clears throat> before entering the Army. I worked at the University of Michigan Hospital while waiting to be admitted to school in Ypsilanti. Now maybe you know, some of you have heard of Ypsilanti. I had a hard time spelling it. <laughs> but it was uh, <clears throat> about 15, 20 miles away from Ann Arbor. And I was anxious to go to a college uh, where <clears throat> I could stay at the dorm rather than live at home. And that, that's just kind of a feeling that you get when you, you're growing up and you don't want your parents to always <laughs> be looking after you. <laughs> and I was going through that period. So my father allowed me to live at the dorm and that was about 15 miles away from Ann Arbor and uh, I didn't have to commute every day. I lived right there and uh, got my degree then from Ypsilanti, Michigan. I don't know if you know how to spell it, but it's an interesting uh, town. 
town, and today it's called uh, Michigan Eastern Michigan University. Excuse me. My parents had a very strong desire that each of us attend college and get a degree. And they worked hard to make that dream come true. They were also able to become American citizens due to the passage of the McCarran, McCarran Walter Immigration and Nationality Act. This act allowed Japanese and other Asian immigrants to become naturalized citizens for the first time. And I remember my mother having to study very hard because she had to pass test about our government and some history of our, go our, of our country. So it was a challenge for both my parents. But they both became American citizens. No charge of espionage or sabotage was ever filed against any of the 120,000 people who were interned and yet we were forced to live in these detention camps during World War II. What our government did was very wrong and unconstitutional, and no amount of money could ever pay for the suffering men endured. My parents loved this country and were badly mistreated. I loved this country and still do, and was, and was mistreated my rights were violated. <clears throat> On August 10th of 1988, the Civil Liberties Act was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan. This law provided $20,000 in restitution to individuals of Japanese ancestry who were interned during World War II and to those who may be determined as eligible. <clears throat> The law also provided for an apology by Congress on behalf of the people of the United States. The apology is an acknowledgement of the injustice of the wartime incarceration of the Japanese Americans. It is a recognition and affirmation findings of the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of citizens that a grave injustice was done to both citizens and permanent residents, aliens of Japanese ancestry by the evacuation, relocation, and internment of civilians during World War II. At this point in my story, I would like you to know that um, later than after I graduated, uh, George, Umamura and I were able to get married, and um, we were married for 70 years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, passed away last year. And we raised three children, and we're blessed with seven grandchildren and nine soon to be ten great grandchildren. And I hope the story of internment helped you to understand what the Japanese American experienced as an important part of U.S. history. Now, I wasn't looking above to see all the photos that you saw, but I hope you saw most of them. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, uh, I know, I think one of the things as I was talking to your sons and, and to Kathy earlier, they said, you know, we always even learn a little bit more, something we didn't know about your experience and about the experience overall. And I think uh, we are so grateful for, for sh you sharing that uh, and then hopefully sparking an interest in learning more and understanding about the history that happened so it doesn't repeat itself moving forward. Um, and I think one of the things that the Idol Jorg is proud about is, and you know, we try really hard to make sure the authentic authors of the story are telling that story, and that we are a place of learning 
and inspiration and get more so that we can be better citizens to our to our fellow man. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. I'm expecting and hoping there may be a few questions for this incredible opportunity. And um, uh, uh, Yoko, um, if you're here to help translate, she'll have a microphone. Maybe you can kind of stand to the side to translate. Um, we've kind of decided to do this in a Phil Donahue sort of way. <laughs> so if you raise your hand, or make good eye contact with me, or the young lady over there on that side, Jamie Simic, uh, we will bring you the microphone and provide the opportunity to ask Jean Kathy directly a question. So who wants to start? I was... Oh wait, I've got the microphone. Don't you start without me. <laughs> I was thinking about all the unmeasurable things that you lost in family time, special family events, being able to cook your own foods, etc. Um, I was very interested in, and it's okay if you don't want to answer, but how did you integrate this afterwards? So much trauma, so much, I would personally feel so angry, and it would be really hard for me to be around people who had treated me that for the rest of my life. And know that I'm working and contributing in this country that did this to me. Would you be able to talk a little bit about how you rectified that and work through that? And then what you um, taught your children or what you did with that, how you used that for a good way? Thank you. Well, that's a very, very good question. You know, you could just. Um, I feel that my parents, my mother and father, were both very strong believers of God, and they had a strong faith. And I remember the night that we were evacuated before that we were actually moved out of our homes, how they prayed. And uh, I think their faith in the Lord was very strong and they kept us together in the same way and I, I'm just thankful to the Lord that, that somehow we ended up in Indiana <laughs> and, uh, we did too. and uh, my uh, husband whom I married worked for Lily, Eli Lily and Company and we raised our family. <clears throat> our oldest daughter and uh, our two sons over here and their children. So we have a lot to be thankful for too. And I think it's sometimes it's a challenge of wanting to live and somehow things turned out. Thank you for asking that question. First of all, thank you for sharing this uh, chapter of our country's uh, history with uh, the, well, the newer generation. Uh, perhaps you can also enlighten us a little bit about uh, the 442nd uh, uh, boys, uh, whom I had the uh, honor and pleasure of befriending a few when they were my patients when I was working at the uh, University of Utah. Okay, well the 442nd was made up of all Niseis, which is Japanese Americans, uh, and they um, were sent to certain parts of Europe where the battle was extremely, oh, um, I can't find a word to describe how awful the battles were fighting against Germany and I believe Italy and um, I read this book that was written by a group of people, group of soldiers that fought and uh, gave their lives so freely so that the USA would, could win the war and if it weren't for them we may not have won the war. And it's a wonderful book. Right now I don't have the name of it, but um, 
a lot of Japanese Niseis, we call them, um, gave their lives to USA because they love the country. Right, you got one right there? I was wondering, you uh, mentioned that your father had made some watercolors while and you were an internment. Uh -huh. Do you still have those? Yes, I do. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. My father loved uh, to paint, and uh, I have some, I wish I had brought them, I didn't think to do that. <laughs> but he did do some uh, watercolors of what the camp looked like. And you know, they're beautiful paintings. He had a heart that saw beauty even in that desert area where it was hot and uncomfortable every day during the summer and bitter cold in the winter. But somehow he found uh, beauty and put that in a painting. And I have those hanging in my bedroom. Um, I was wondering if you could have a two-part question about your sister, Mary, when you said that the only people that were excluded from going to a camp or in an asylum or a hospital, but your sister didn't go with you. So how that worked out that she was able to get a, a pass to be somewhere else? Right. And then what, if you have any insight at all, when you all were reunited, what her experience had been not being with you and just kind of how that worked out when she wasn't with you for that time in her experience. Right. Um, uh, she lived in Pullman, Washington, which is the eastern part of the state of Washington. Near, it's near uh, Spokane. And that area was not uh, in the area that you could, you could live there. And in other words, along the coast, it wasn't the whole state of Washington that was that, uh, that you were not allowed to live. Yeah. The border was 200 miles from the West Coast. <laughs> yes. There's a map. Oh, thank you. Well, but it, right. it was 200 miles from the coast, mm -hmm. so anyone who lived from the West Coast within 200 miles was relocated. Right. So if that helps you. So my aunt was in a university outside of that. Right. But then she had a second part of the question, which was reunion. And how did you oh. reunite with Mary and live together? And what was that like? Right. Uh, we were reunited. We were reunited. Reunited, excuse me. Uh, because this minister who she met in... Wisconsin, Wisconsin, at a Wisconsin uh, church conference, um, the minister there inquired to my sister about her parents and why were they in these camps, and he said he would help her parents and her brothers and sisters so, too. Yeah, you told that part, but what about the uh, emotional aspects of physical reunion? You oh, know, how yeah. was it mm -hmm. uh, to actually see Mary for the first time? Uh, do you recall that? Well, yes, I do, and, and it was it was a wonderful reunion, and we were then in Ann Arbor able to all live together. So it was a, a wonderful way of helping families that were separated from each other. And, we came together there, so. Uh, did that help answer the question over here? Okay, Jean, um, I'm Janet Brothers, and um, my parents and I were also in a uh, relocation camp. We were in uh, Poston. And my mother was in charge of the beauty shops. There were three camps. So she would have a driver that would take her around. But anyway, um, and we were relocated to Cleveland after that. My father was a part of the 442nd. And, um, and as a result of his service, he was able to get his, his degree from Case Western Reserve afterward under the GI Bill. And um, so, in 2010, I believe, uh, the 442nd was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest 
um, civilian honor. And so my sister and I both have had a medal because of my father. He passed away in 2001. Um, the book about the 442nd is Facing the Mountain, and it was written by the man who wrote The Men in the Boat. And it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent book. And, and as some closure, right now at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, there is a, a book, and it's part of, it's called the Irecho Project. And um, all of the names of the 125,000 people that were detained or put into relocation camps are in this book. It's the size of the Gutenberg Bible. It weighs about 25 pounds, they say. And so uh, when you go there, you know how people would put a stone on a, um, a, a, a whatever, the cemetery marker? Well, they give you a little blue stamp, and you find your name in this book, and you put a blue stamp by it, which kind of brings closure. So in November, my husband and my sister and her husband went to LA and we went in there and we stamped the names, our names, and then we stamped our parents' names and my grandmother's name. And we were told that there are some people who no longer have relatives that can stamp their names, so did we want to do that? So we each stamped a name in the book. So, That's wonderful. so hopefully, and it's going to travel the United States after a year in LA. So maybe the Islander can get it, and then we can run and stamp names too. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm truly sorry for your experiences and for the other people's experiences in the camps on the West Coast. Uh, I really mean that. But uh, I do have a question, and you know, what do you think FDR should have done if he had a real belief with the limited information that he had at the time that there was some kind of a subversive, active group in the Japanese American community? What, what action do you think he should have taken? That's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, I don't know. I'm, that's the our decision, what his decision would have been. But he had a lot of so-called uh, people on his staff that probably would have found good answers. I don't I really feel in my heart that the uh, rash and way that we were evacuated, we were forced to just leave everything, you know, forced to sell everything, forced to leave our homes and our education and whatever um, by a certain date. And it was, to me, I don't know how my parents really handled it. And they handled it well. But I, when I say that, um, I, I look at them with high respect. And uh, because my, both my mother and father were uh, such strong believers in, in God, they prayed to God that God would help us, our family, our mother and father, in the right way. And I feel, here we are in Indiana, and I feel God guided us in the right direction. We didn't come here directly, but, you know, in a roundabout way, we were able to tolerate the experience. Maybe during the time we were going through it, it was hard and tears were shed and we were exasperated in many ways, but um, with patience and guidance from God, I think we ended up in a wonderful place called Indiana. <laughs> so thank you. Jean? Uh, yes. At one point, um, the incarcerees were asked to sign the loyalty oath, and were you asked 
And did you sign? <laughs> I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. At one point, incarcerates were required to uh, address a loyalty or oath. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And were you uh, asked? And did you sign? I feel, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not real sure if I did or not because of our age. I think there was an age requirement. Well, how about your parents? Oh, yes, we got a photo. We had, we forced them to sign it. <laughs> John, my brother, and I um, begged our parents to sign it. They didn't want to sign it. Well, why, why, why would they do that? Why did we do that? Yes. Because if we did that, we would not be forced to go to Japan. They had a, I think they had a boat ready to take a group of people to Japan. If you didn't uh, 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 give your promise to the U.S. government and do everything they wanted you to do, um, you were safe. But if you in any way felt that you were not going to, uh, how should I say it? So, or the Constitution. I mean, there was this. You know, my, my parents, at their, because they were born in the U.S., they were U.S. citizens. This was called an oath of allegiance. Mm -hmm. And it was a physical way of getting a commitment that these people were not yet U.S. citizens, so it was before my grandparents actually took their citizenship mm -hmm. exam for them to commit. And so, and so the children really wanted them to commit I remember physically. I remember begging them to, because it was the right thing to do. It was a safe thing to do. Maybe I should put it that way. And the, the, the government would not send them on a ship and send them back to Japan. Um, I remember crying over it. And my parents then listened to my brother and I. See, my sister was not with us, so she was out of the picture in a way. but. It was up to my brother John and I, and we were still pretty young, but still we knew that they had to sign that oath. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is about your the sharing of your heritage. Uh, the immigrant experience is usually very difficult, and super strong people are able to do it. Mm -hmm. But did your parents, as immigrants, share their Japanese culture strongly with you? And then, as a result of this experience, were you able to share your culture with your children? Japanese culture. Are you asking that, was I able Did to your parents share it with you? Oh, with the Japanese immigrant? culture? Yes. And then, were you able to share it with your children? Yeah, well, yes, I, I, I'm i not sure if I did a real good job of raising <laughs> Japanese culture. Um, I think I had learned about, more about Japanese culture by going to Japan and, at, and in my adult life. Uh, and my husband and I were able to go to Japan at least twice. and. We felt more. Um, we felt better about learning the culture when we went to J actually went to Japan and visited our relatives and talked with them and and uh, learned more about the Japanese culture. Of course, this was after the war. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, our parents. We tried to teach them American culture. <laughs> and, uh, so it was hard, especially during the evacuation period. And we said, no, we don't want to go to Japan and live. They asked us. And they decided that they were going to um, listen to our prayers and our desires. When I say our, I mean the three children, and especially my older sister. And. Um, we just felt like we were Americans and we wanted to stay here. We didn't want to go to Japan. And my father's family raised um, the whole little 
silkworms. Oh, silkworms, I can remember. <laughs> and I remember when we, we had a chance, uh, the three of us had a chance to go to Japan when we were young, and I was still in grade school. And my mother took us to Japan for the, that very purpose, for, so us to, for uh, the children to understand Japanese culture and so forth. And we spent the whole summer there with our relatives. And, so uh, you owe uh, my brothers and me a trip to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm getting out of that answer. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> moving on. I think we're back there. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, I wanted to ask how you met your husband, and then when you met, how you shared your experience from the camp. That you, if he also experienced the same thing, and if it differed, how did you share that with him? The question was, how did you meet Dad? Oh. And then, um, how did you share the camp experience? So you can talk a little bit about the differences between what he did in camp and what you did in camp. Well, George was also in camp, but not very long. He first, the government felt that <clears throat> anybody in, that was attending college before evacuation actually took place, like you know, my sister who was uh, attending the University of Washington, uh, right right before we were evacuated, and so was George. He attended the University of Washington. And they felt that if you were in camp, but you had been going to college, and you had the means that meant money, you, you had to have the money to go to college from camp. Um, if you could uh, apply to the, whatever school you wanted to go to, as long as it wasn't along the coast, you could leave camp. So the government was interested in allowing young people to continue their education if they could afford it, and they had the means to go. So what happened to Dad? What was his experience with camp? Well, I remember my husband uh, said that he applied at uh, Ohio Wesleyan, which is a private method school in uh, Ohio, and uh, he, he was accepted. and. I, I really can't tell you where he got the money to go, but he did. He didn't have the same camp living experience as you did. Right. He, he was there just maybe three or four months in camp when the government said, we want those of you who started college and can afford it, apply, and you, you, you will not have to stay in camp as long as you doesn't take you back to the state of Washington, Oregon, and California. So he took advantage of that offer and was able to go to a school in Ohio. But you knew him from uh, junior high, right? Right. I knew him. How, did you, how did you meet? Oh, oh, he was chasing after your older sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard, and I'm going to hear what she tells you. <laughs> He's about, he was my, my, my he was about the same age as my sister. My <laughs> sister. And he was very interested in her, but I changed his mind. <laughs> well, I think that's a great spot to end. I know we could do this all day. And while you changed his mind, I know you've enlightened many by sharing your story with us today. And for that, we are so grateful. What a, what a great, please. We also want to thank Barnes and Thornburg, the Japan Foundation New York, and the Japan, Japan America Society of Indiana for their support and for getting us connected with you to be able to share this with us today. Um, we've got some surveys there as we continue to develop programming for the Idol Org. We'd love to have your thoughts and feedback on today. 
and I hope you will take some time to explore the changing views Dorothy Lang exhibition, uh, now open our special ex exhibition gallery. Um, if you didn't take a donut, uh, please don't leave them for me. And stop, by, but you're starting to feel a little hungry. The Khan's Cafe out there is phenomenal, and it's a great spot for lunch, and I don't think it's raining, so it's a great view of the canal. Uh, you may have seen some of the books and some of the merchandise available. There's a couple of great uh, Dorothea Lang photography books that cover uh, this time, her work covering this time, and they're available in the bookstore. And of course, members have always get a discount at the Cafe in the store. Um, so, thank you both. Uh oh. You, well, if there's a few more questions, absolutely, I think if you're willing. I know you've got a few students here, a few neighbors, uh, and really appreciate uh, your family making the drives from Salt Lake and from Denver. So we're so thrilled to have you all here. Thank you again so much for showing me. Thank you for being here today.